And we're back. We back. All right. So, uh, would you say that Hollywood Basic uh, didn't do a good job of promoting the album, or do you think they did all they could? This is the feeling I got. Like, I think, and this is what he said. Like, I know Dave believed in the record from the floor to the ceiling, right? And uh, that's why he signed us. That's why he took the risk, you know what I mean, on putting us on. I feel like we went to a label that was a subsidiary of the Disney company, right? Hollywood Records. Like, it's big, and that conveys a lot of advantages, right? You know, they've got scale, and they can do a lot of things. But they also are a profit entity, right? And so they want to see how they're going to make their money tenfold quickly, and they're not going to have a lot of patience to be like, okay, let's work this, or let's try this, you know what I mean? And I remember Dave having a frank conversation with him, and he was like, yo, they want a crisscross right now. They're asking me, like, where's Hollywood Basics crisscross? They want a hit group. They want, you know what I mean? And so even I think a lot of the decisions like that were made, I remember. So part of when you do a record, you promote it, you do a video, you know, you do advertising campaigns. And I remember like the advertising campaigns were limited. And so we're like, and it's like, yeah, they're not going to, they want to see stuff happening before they invest additional. And it's like, well, it's like a chicken and egg problem. If you don't invest, you ain't going to see the, the, the return on like it. Cause people aren't going to know about it. Um, and I think the limited advertising they did do, like in the source, people, you know, running into Evil D on the street. He's like, yo, I saw y'all in the source. Yo, what's going on? You know, that kind of stuff. Like it's, large scale impact um obviously that stuff costs a lot of money too but then um i remember we were like well we are a very visual group you know what i mean with the african uh regalia you know what i mean with our outfits and then with our dance moves and our routines and stuff like that's important to capture visually um we should do a video so i remember there was a lot of battles with we should do a video and they're like yeah we don't really have the budget for y'all to do a video like we need to do a video and dave was like well he knew a lady that did commercials that was kind of trying to get into the music business and so she was like okay you know i'm gonna cut my rate and i can try to work out a video and figure out stuff and kind of you know get staff that are similarly you know people technical people that are also trying to get into the music biz that are willing willing to cut their rates and so we got them uh, he got them to agree to put together a video within a budgetary amount that Hollywood Basic was willing to put up. But again, it was it was a struggle to even get that. And so we went out to L.A. to do a video for the Doing Damage in My Native Language and stuff. And I remember we were like, yeah, we need to get dancers. Like, well, how much is that going to cost? I don't know. We're going to talk to the dance studio. They're like, well, we don't have no money for them. So if you can get them to do it on the strength, more power to you. Otherwise, it's just going to be you two brothers. We're like, nah, we need, to, we need to go big with it. You know what I mean? We need to let people know. It's like we want to throw African dancers in with the hip-hop beats and have it be like this. And it's like, okay, temper expectations, but we'll see what we can do. Um, so we went out and did manage to film that video. Um, not as expansive as we'd want to, but we kind of captured some of the flavor we were, we were trying to represent. Um, we did have a dance company um, that was visiting LA and they were kind of excited, like, oh yeah, this is cool. Yeah, we'll hop in. And then obviously other people who looked at it as like, you know, an opportunity to kind of get into a music video that were willing to, to come along and stuff. And we had some cool, scouted some some cool locations and, and put a video together. But to me, that was just kind of emblematic of the whole situation where they didn't really want to spend. They kind of wanted it to take off on its own and then come behind it and add. And if it did, you know, throw it to the wall. If it sticks, right. great. If it don't, we'll just kind of, and I think that hampered, you know, kind of the prominence of the project. Because I think just especially as ripe as the, the market was with the Afrocentric content, you know, with the uniqueness of the project and how we were coming, like it could have done way bigger than it did. And I think going back in retrospect, seeing it reissued and seeing people still talk about it, even on that limited scale, it's like, man, only if y'all had come along a little bit more, a little stronger with the wallet, you know? Right. I think it would have done a lot more. What eventually happened with uh, Hollywood Basic and your deal? So it was one of those things where we were ended up um, caught in limbo. Um, you know, the other things were happening at the label too. 
Um, like I said, our, our strongest champion was Dave Funk and Klein. He was also having, at the time, health issues. You know, he was uh, initially when we met him, gangster limp. Um, he had been in a wheelchair as well. Anyway, so he was going through health problems and stuff. So we didn't really have an advocate. And I think folks know from other artists, like the person who signed you isn't there to be like, yo, y'all need to, y'all need to, you know, things tend to get pushed to the side. Other priorities get pushed forward. And I think in retrospect, I don't know this for a fact, but I feel like Hollywood Basic itself was also getting pressure from Hollywood Records to be like, yo, bring in the money, you know what I mean? Bring in the hits, bring in the... Um, and so they were quick to try to, you know, shift. Um, and again, being naive and, and not knowing. And, you know, we had like some different folks that were stepped into like manage or like rep us, but they didn't really, um, as it turns out, know a whole lot more or like got got stuff accomplished. Uh, so we just kind of were in limbo and we're just kind of hanging out there. And so initially when we came out, we felt the promotion and the push and the backing was, was lacking. So you can imagine as things progressed, it just kind of became more and more odd and weird and stuff. And so it was just like, yeah, we're not really a priority or are we like, where do we, a lot of it was even just like, where do we stand? Like, yo, y'all still, you know, because when you sign the contracts too, you get that whole option thing and then write a first refusal. And so it's like, well, if you're not going to do anything with me, can I take my talents, you know, to South Beach? Like, what's the deal? Right. Like, what's going <laughs> on? And um, trying to figure all that out. So it's like mad confusing, mad frustrating. You know what I mean? Being like, yo, we was right there. We were in Billboard magazine like last week. It was all good a week ago. And like now, like what's what's going on? Um, trying to figure all that out. And so, I mean, we kind of, you know, you kind of know the deal as well. You know what I mean? Like you can kind of see when things aren't, you know, being pushed. Uh, so we started trying to figure out alternative plans and, you know, figure out where do we go from here? What should we do? And I think just thinking back, we probably should have just seized the day right then and there and went. I think we were still thinking, okay, if we're not with this label, what other label can we go to? You know, and they'd always be like, are you still under contract? Or like, kind of, sort of, but not really. I don't know. <laughs> like, oh, right. well, what a, uh, have they given you a release? Like, uh, let me go ask them. Hey, are you, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like one of those weird, and so I think that kind of just burned cycles for us of like just being in Netherland, right? Uh, being in this weird uh, record industry purgatory. Um, but I also think since we only knew the formal industry structure and we didn't know any folks that were on the independent grind, that was where we kind of limited our shots and you know how it's kind of difficult within that anyway. And so we were taking shots, you know, with other majors or other, you know, indie majors, if you will, um, that are also big behemoths and stuff that aren't necessarily like trying to get something different. They're just trying to get, well, what's the next thing that's going to pop off? So we also, I think, wasted a lot of cycles and like trying to chase after these big Uber labels that didn't really see the same vision as we did. And so I think that was like a, a bit of a downturn in our momentum because it was like, man, well, you know, why can't these cats see what we're talking about? Why aren't they trying to make moves? You know, and they'd always be like, what is, what's the situation with basic? What are y'all doing with them? It's, I don't know. We moving on or whatever. Um, and then I think about like folks that I know from around that era that made like strides and they didn't have a major. So they just went independent by design or by necessity, right? Uh, right. Necessity being the mother of invention. And that actually worked out better because then they, you know, were in control and could set up situations on their own. Is this the model that you used uh, afterwards? Did you uh, decide to go independent? Uh, how much time did you uh, spend uh, deciding if you wanted to uh, pursue uh, music as a, a career? Um, I mean, I think it kept on for some years. You know what I mean? We just kept trying different angles or different, you know, contacts, connections. Um, we never stopped, like, rocking. Like, even if it wasn't as formally as Zimbabwe legit, we'd still perform do shows when shows came up and, and rock out and, you know, just stay connected to like making music, setting up our own scenes. Uh, for a long time, my brother had a scene pop in like in the Lower East Side, he had a baby Jupiter and he was doing kind of not even just like rap, like 
you know, world fusion and music and dance and, and stuff like that. Um, and so we just stay out there. But I think it was in the 2000s, uh, 2003 maybe or something, I started talking to more people that were doing the independent route and folks that had pressed up their own vinyl and, and got, you know, P&D deals. And I started being like, oh, so you can get a P&D deal. Okay. Well, it's cats that just came out of pocket and pressed stuff but got distribution situations or got people to buy the stuff on, uh, not on consignment, like just buy it straight out, um, especially overseas. And I started being like, oh, okay, so we don't have to like just, you know, try to penetrate this impenetrable, you know, major uh, record label wall out here. Um, so I got with uh, uh, Domination Recordings, which was like an indie label. And they had um, a bunch of cats. It's so funny. Every time I run into folks, I run into John Doe. And be like, oh, you used to be on Domination. Or St. Mike, you used to be on Domination. <laughs> be like, oh, you know, uh, Jazz Addicts. Oh, you guys messed with Domination back in the day. Um, but it was cool because it was kind of like our own little hub of all artists that had different um, experiences from major to kind of indie, but just kind of putting out music and just using that collective vehicle, if you will, of the label to bring attention to everybody else's projects. But um, as I started talking and dealing with them, I started realizing like, oh, okay, actually there's distributors out in Japan that will pick up product. Um, oh, you can license songs for different records. You know, people are doing compilation records and paying, you know, real money to like get songs on these cool compilations with other dope artists and stuff and so started figuring that out and then we were actually like on a I want to say a hiatus because we never really stopped but I wasn't putting out Zimbabwe legit albums uh, and then my cousin and I you know come back full circle um, we're like yo let's put together a joint and it's like it's not really Zimbabwe legit because it's not me and Akim uh, so we put together a record called OUO because um, literally it was of unknown origin it was just like it just came out of the blue um, and we did that through domination recordings that was more like a typical P&D type deal but uh, it also kind of gave us like full control like on you know what we recorded what songs we put on there what producers we used, what guest appearances we had, and did that with them. But that also connected me with a lot of other folks that were doing like the independent grind. So I linked up with Cadence um, from Raw Produce, and that opened my eyes to a lot of different things too, because he had success as an independent. I think he was telling me um, for the Raw Produce, I think they pressed up. I don't know, a couple hundred copies of a record on their own out of pocket and then got an order for like a thousand plus or two thousand from Japan and didn't even have it. And we're just like, they're like, we'll buy them. You know, we want this many and stuff. And it's like, oh, if there's a market of people that are actually going to pay you up front for products. Like, let's go down that route instead of trying to get with a label and hope for, hope for. It's like, just make it clear cut. You still own the records, you own the masters and you can push out the stuff in the way you want to put it out. And so um, that was cool. How did uh, Brothers from the Mother finally see light in 2005? So that ended up being one of those domination uh, recordings connections. So my man Jay at Glow in the Dark Records was homies with uh, Peter Augustine, uh, Culturama, and uh, day by day, um, Dave Fisher. Uh, so he was like, he hit me up and he's like, yeah, my man Jay was asking me if you're still doing Zimbabwe legit. And, um, you know, if you guys, you know, we know you released the EP because the first, re the record we put out with Hollywood basic was just an EP. So we didn't have all, all the songs on it and we were going to, drop the album later and then that ended up not happening and so I was talking to uh, Jay Glow in the Dark and he was like yo would you be interested in doing something with all that, that material from that you know never seen the Light of Day album um, and then including songs off the EP and I was like yeah how would we work that out and so we talked and, and they were really um, 
they had a super good grind because they put out a lot of stuff independently, like totally independently. Glow in the Dark was their record label. They had a great promotions team. They had like good publicists they were working with, and they had a lot of good relationships with distributors in the UK and Japan and in uh, different parts of Europe and and stuff. And so they were like, "Yeah, we can get it out." We can get people to pick it up. You know, we can do vinyl. We can do CD. We can do a lot of things. We can do promotion. And so that piqued my interest because, oh, you don't promote it? It's like, oh, okay. That's what we're looking for. We ain't (laughs) just trying to do the same thing again, right? Like, you fool me once. Like, I'm not just going to drop it and hope that it does well. And then seeing how their records did and how they promoted um, their work and kind of their plan and their vision and they really loved the record, you know what I mean? They, like, le- legitimately, you know, no pun intended, loved the Zimbabwe Legit record. They were like, yo, this is good stuff. Like, they would ask the same things you were asking. Like, yo, why didn't this blow up? Like, why did y'all should have been, like, on everything? And we're like, we try, we're trying. But um, so talking to them and talking to Jay, working that out, um, we did some shows with them as well and you know they bring out mad heads and I mean they stayed on the road a lot too and they just had a really good game plan um so we worked out you know the particulars and specifics uh, on the business side and it made a lot of sense um it's a, a workable way to do it and then it was also like catharsis for me because it's like all this stuff that I wanted people to hear that they didn't get to and that people would always hit me up about you know it's like we can finally let it see the light of day and let people, um, you know, kind of hear it and feel it, you know what I mean? And it's also that nostalgic, you know, throwback to like, oh, snap, you guys, that's what you were talking about. You guys are ahead of the times. So um, anyway, we worked it out. Um, so they put it out domestically through Glow in the Dark. They also connected with the situation to put out an import version that had like two other tracks that were on the U.S. version through a label in Japan, and that was another agreement. Um, So it just worked out. It's like a really good situation to like, and then to do it on vinyl as well, to be able to like press up, you know, a full length album on vinyl with like the cover art. Um, It was dope. And they were like, oh, for the CD, we want to throw the video on there. And I was like, oh, I guess, (laughs) man. He's like, no, the video's dope. But you know, as an artist, you're always like ultra protective of stuff you did like 10 years ago, like, um, but I mean, I believe in it. Obviously, I did it. I, I liked it. Um, and so we put that together and that, that worked out well. And they, they promoted that. True to their word, they promoted the heck out of that thing. We got write ups galore. Like, mad people, you know, gave it a lot of love. You know, I was reading write ups from Japanese magazines, hitting my friends to get the translation. Like, what they say? What did they say? Oh, I said, it's dope. I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, Italian magazines, you know, and then obviously like the US magazines. Um, it got a lot of love and a lot of light. And I think it also was a, a good way to cause a resurgence in Zimbabwe Legit because at that time I was kind of trying to figure out, like, well, how do we pop back out? And we had some stuff in the works, but it was like, this was the perfect, you know, uh, gateway to, to, to get that to launch, you know what I mean? Especially to generate a buzz and get some attention for it. Right. Uh, two years later, House of Stone project. Can you take me back to that? Yeah, House of Stone, man. I was, that's the favorite record I did because, um, I mean, I don't want to go Scarface on them, but who put this together? Me. That's who. <laughs> <laughs> who I trust me. So after like chasing after this dude and that dude um, and trying to do this label thing and trying to do this and being frustrated and, you know, being let down, I was like, man, I should just do this record I have in my head and just do it, you know what I mean? And make it happen. And I got to give a mad shout out, mad love to YZ, man, because he was the catalyst. Like, Vicious Cycle is the first song on the album for a reason, because that's the first song I did on the project. And, um, I mean, it's an incredible song. Like, uh, he, I think, perfectly captured the vision of what I had in mind for that song. Uh, It's a shame what you got to do to try to get ahead in the game, plenty to lose and nothing to gain. But if you maintain through the pain, you'll be stronger and you can hold on a little longer. So I was almost rapping that to myself, partly. But, um when I reconnected with him, cause we'd met him back in the day. I think we met him. 
I may be wrong, but I'm going to say I met him at uh, Professor X from the X-Clan's birthday party at uh, Maria Davis event or something in New York. Anyway, um, so Hollywood basically put us in touch with the X-Clan because we were going to try to connect and work on something. And so we were at this party, um, you know, uh, big up recipes to Professor X and the X-Clan. And we were there and we were talking about stuff and uh, we were going to perform uh, and YZ was performing and he tore the stage down. It's like, wow. Like, and I'd always been a fan, you know, since thinking of a master plan. And so getting to meet him and, and chop it up with him. And he was just a real cool brother. And he was like, you know, deep in the industry. Like he knew, you know, what was going on and stuff. And we connected uh, right before he moved out to Atlanta. And so we never like worked on anything but we had mm -hmm. gone by his offices when he had 720 management and you know sat and build with him a little bit um so anyway uh fast forward to i'm working on the house of stone and me and him had connected and he, he actually hit me up or i hit him up online and we traded numbers and he had called he's like you know who this is i was like oh snap why is he or whatever and i was like yo can i tell you when I was out in college at the college radio station, I remember when you sent me a drop when uh, the Return of the Holy One dropped and whatever. And he was like, oh, snap, that's cool. And I'd been rocking his music on the radio, but it was cool to reconnect. But I told him, I was like, yo, I'm working on this joint um, called Vicious Cycle. He's like, oh, send me the track. Send me the track. I was like, oh, okay. You win it? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he's like, when you need it, by when you, he's like, let me know. Cause you know, the quicker I do it, you know, I don't get caught up in something else. I was like, oh, no, that's a bet. That's... So he was, like, real cool, you know, and obviously he wrote a dope verse, you know, uplifting as he does to that joint. But once he did that joint, it was like, you know, the ball rolling downhill, you know, the rolling stone going downhill, like everything else, too, because it's a lot easier to be like, I've got a vision for an album called House of Stone, you know, the first track is me and YZ. Because, oh, you rocking with YZ? Okay, you know what I mean? As opposed right. to being like, oh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, a whole lot of I'm trying to. Um, reached out to Prince Poe. He was real cool. He hopped on a joint, um, had been building with Breeze Ever Flowing, and he was good friends with my brother. And my brother had connected him with a lot of shows and different, and they had connected on shows and different stuff. And so, um, you know, he was willing to hop on it. Um, and then, part of what I wanted to do on House of Stone too was like not just get people who I thought would fit together like off of oh well, these guys have done a song book together before let them do a song together on my record it was like what if I have Chub Rock and Fast Air on a track I don't think that's wow. ever happened before so let right. me try to make that happen on my record or whatever um, let me get Prince Poe and Stickman and um from Dead Prez. And when I hit Stickman, he was real cool and we were building on the track. And he said, yeah, a lot of times when cats want Dead Prez on a track, or want Stick on a track, they try to craft a track that they think I would rap over. He's like, but this joint is just like a straight up vibey, like boom bap joint. He's like, I I'm digging it and stuff. And so we talked back and forth. So um, it was just me saying like, all right, I'm, I'm done waiting. You know what I mean? Let me just put together what I have in my mind and see if I can pull it off and pull it together with a bunch of people that I've connected with over the years and known over the years that kind of vibe, you know, with the type of topics and subject matter and music that I do and, uh, you know, just pull this whole thing together. And so right. did that. It was a labor of love, but it, it worked out like it worked out real well. Cause I was also then connected with a distributor who could, you know, press it up. I was connected with the publicist who could promote it. Um, you know, we connected with Mike G from the Jungle Brothers, who'd been like a long time, you know, idol and like a respected legend. And so, you know, we talked across the years, but we hadn't done any music. And so it was like, finally, the brothers from the mother and the Jungle Brother right. <laughs> can connect on a track. And he's like, to this day, one of the, him and YZ are like some of the coolest cats I've ever worked with in the music business, you know, just on some talent but also just on kind of you know the vibe and being cool cool peoples and good peoples you know what i mean and being real cool to work with fun to work with um right. so that was real cool